Oh, I'm sorry. We have to do the question. Yeah, pre-debate survey. Sorry. <clears throat> okay, overwhelming on the side of I am now. Okay. <laughs> All right, so first we'll have uh, Dr. Hassan Mir from Tampa uh, come up and talk to us about uh, uh, the treatment of intertrochanteric hip fractures with ORIF. All right, so uh, our small group was a pretty nice discussion. Hopefully everybody else had good discussions in their rooms, and I think some of them are still going. But uh, as, they, as they come in, we'll kind of debate this topic over the next 10 or 15 minutes, and then go from there. So our debate is, uh, is on this case here. So this is a 75-year-old female, ground level fall, isolated injury, uh, relatively healthy community ambulator. It doesn't say uh, if she uses a walker or not, uh, but likely not if it's not mentioned here. And so we've got to discuss if we would fix this with a sliding hip screw versus a cephalomedullary nail. So how many folks in this room have used a sliding hip screw, dynamic hip screw? All right. How many folks under the age of 40 have used a sliding hip screw, dynamic hip screw? I only see like two hands going up, maybe three or four. Yeah. Okay. So a lot less, right, with that. And that's been the practice trend, right? Everybody's nailing everything because it's easier, faster, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm going to try to convince you that maybe we shouldn't always be doing that, even though, disclosure, I nail them all. But so... Um, with films, with, with any injury, right, you want to have adequate workup, adequate films. So this is uh, an AP pelvis, right, not just an AP of the hip, because the film that I actually have up in the operating room is the AP pelvis, because I'm templating, even though that's a lost art too, right? How many of you have actually taken out uh, fracture paper and templated for a case, right? It's a lost art. But at least mental templating, having the contralateral hip to look at your neck shaft angle, and then to look at the relationship between the tip of your trochanter and the center of your femoral head. That's a, that's a really good way to judge your varus valgus alignment, is not just the neck shaft, because that can be rotationally affected, but the tip of your troch to the center of your femoral head uh, is less affected by rotational uh, differences side to side. Um, Something else that can be helpful uh, in the workup of these patients is occasionally we get these injuries, especially in stable appearing patterns, where it's kind of difficult to tell if the troch's involved or not. Is it a femoral neck or, a, or an inner troch? And, and that's a big difference in how you're booking the case. You're booking it for fixation versus an arthroplasty. So getting a gentle traction view can make a big difference for patient care and how you, uh, how you schedule the case so you don't get, uh, don't get yelled at by your attending when they show up the next morning in the wrong bed and the wrong implant systems in the room. Uh, as far as lateral imaging, this one's not showing up great, but uh, unless you really hate your geriatric patients, I would advocate for getting cross-table laterals and not frog legs. I don't know if you've ever seen them do a frog leg lateral on a, on a patient, but they literally grab them and externally rotate them through their fracture, and it's torture. So getting a cross-table lateral where they flex up the uninjured limb to look across at the injured hip is probably much more humane. And then getting full length views of the femur because we're having a lot more patients with implants at multiple spots in their, in their uh, anatomy that we have to sometimes contend with and looking at femoral bow. So as far as implant choices, right, we're debating uh, uh, sliding hip screw devices versus, versus nails. So if it's a stable pattern, really it's dealer's choice, right? So that can be a plate or a nail. But what does stability mean? So unstable is you have this involvement of the posterior medial cortex, which is this area right here, uh, that gives you some sort of support against varus collapse. So that's the, the posterior medial cortex. And, and that shouldn't be confused with the lesser trochanter. The lesser trochanter is a little further down, and you can have a lesser troch that's off, but still have a good, good posterior medial support on a proximal femur. 
Secondly, the obliquity of the fracture. The fracture that you see right here is standard obliquity, right? It starts up at the greater choke and goes down towards the le lesser choke. But occasionally you'll have these patterns that are reverse obliquity uh, that, that literally go the opposite way, and those are ones that are more unstable. Third, if you have extension into subtrochanteric zone, those are unstable patterns. And you know any of these unstable patterns, I think you're justified in saying that this patient needs a nail. And then fourth is the lateral wall, and this is the one that people don't always understand, but it's this little triangle of bone that's left after looking at all those other things. And that's, that's to give you a buttress support of when your hip is collapsing as patients are weight-bearing to keep it from just uncontrolled collapse and shortening a couple centimeters and ending up with, uh, with uh, abductors that aren't offset appropriately and shortening of the limb. So if you have... Um, any of these factors involved, then I agree, you should, you should nail them. If none of these things are involved, like in our case that we're discussing, this looks like a stable intertroch. So I would argue then that if you look at the literature, this is a Cochrane review from 2010, looked at 40, 43 randomized controlled trials and, and a very uh, robust methodology. And their argument was that, that uh, with lower complication rates in comparison with nails, uh, and absence of functional outcome data to the contrary, the sliding hip screw appears superior for stable trochanteric fractures. That's my ad lib in there is for stable fractures. Um, they also go on to comment that, that at least in 2010, this was looking at first generation nail devices and may have had higher complication rates. But uh, even with modern nail devices, I think that for stable fractures, that uh, sliding hip screws still have literature support. Secondly, uh, there weren't a lot of young hands going up that have actually done an open lateral approach to the hip, right? So uh, it's fun to nail fractures. It's quick. It kind of feels like a video game. You're doing it through these tiny incisions. Everybody likes small incisions. But open surgery is becoming a lost art. And there will be times when you have to do open approaches to the hip. So I think that if you have patients that are appropriately indicated, that have a stable fracture pattern, where you can actually do the open approach, see the anatomy, end up with an equivalent outcome that you should take advantage of those opportunities and still do those cases. And for, for folks who, who, who trained doing sliding hip screws more than nails, why give up on something that has a proven track record and good outcomes in addition to some other uh, aspects that we're going to talk about, which is this, the cost, right? So you've got the sliding hip screw type implants. You've got short cephalomedullary nails and then long cephalomedullary nails. And if you care about healthcare systems and you care about you know uh, the national deficit and care about the amount of money that we're spending on healthcare as part of GDP, you should care about this graphic because for a sliding hip screw construct, you're looking at you know depending on your contract with your manufacturers, et cetera. There's a whole lot that goes into this. Roughly 750 bucks for a short cephalomedullary nail about 1500 so about double and then for a long cephalomedular nail 2500 to 3 grand right so if you can get an equivalent outcome with an implant that costs half why would we not use that implant and why would we lose the ability uh, to physically learn how to do it and continue keeping up our skill set so this was going to be a much bigger deal for us how many of you know who Tom Price is Right, so a few hands going up. So he's an orthopedic surgeon from Georgia who was one of our champions when he was in the House of Representatives. Got a great opportunity with the Trump administration. Got, uh, was Secretary of uh, uh, Health and Human Service, Services in charge of uh, CMS and actually got rid of this hip fracture bundle. So we were all going to really care about this a lot if Tom Price hadn't be, uh, been in that role. But uh, so he gets rid of the shift bundle and was going to do a lot more for orthopedic surgery. But then, of course, he uh, decided to fly himself and his wife around the country and the world on, on taxpayer dollars and private jets in first class, and he's no longer in that position. But anyway, while he was still there, he canceled the hip fracture bundle, and so we don't care once again about cost of our implants. But I would say that that may circle back around eventually, uh, especially being in DC. Everything is about value. Everything is, it, all the discussions weren't about opioids. The other discussions were about value and, and bundled payments and things. So the hip fracture bundles may uh, come, back to, come back to haunt us in the future. So anyway, in summary then, I think that for stable fat fractures like this patient has, 
uh, you can get an equivalent outcome with a sliding hip screw. Open surgery is fun, right? As was mentioned earlier, all surgery is fun, but open surgery is a lot of fun if you haven't done this approach and want, or don't get to do it very frequently. It's a nice approach to do. It's a very elegant approach. You can be nice and do a subvastus, and it's a really elegant surgery. You can get a direct reduction. And then cost. I think that even though it's not out of our pocket with bundled payments yet, it is coming out of our tax dollars with Medicare. It is part of our health system, so we should be responsible whenever we can. Thank you. might get up from 17 to 18%. All right. <laughs> Next, we have uh, Dr. Rakesh Mashru uh, from Cooper uh, talking about intramedullary nailing of intertrochanteric femur fractures. So when, uh, when Sako gave me this talk, and I was excited. I was like, you know what? Nailing intertrochs, no problem. But then when I saw it to go up against Hassan, the, uh, the excitement sort of turned into anxiety. So I just want to say thanks, Hassan, for flying down from, uh, flying up from Florida. So. I want to be respectful to him. He has, actually has a flight to catch, so I'm going to be uh, purposely going quick through this. So my, my job is to convince you that uh, intramedullary nails are the way to go for intertrochanteric hip fractures. And a lot of what you just heard from um, Hassan, you're going to hear the exact same thing uh, from me. In fact, the slides are pretty much the same. So in general, the, uh, th this is a big problem. I mean, Hassan just uh, came up here and talked to you about how this is going to um, basically can sometimes overrun our system. The incidence of hip fractures is 250,000 hip fractures a year. Um, this is data from 2016 from the academy. Half of them are, of those are intertrochanteric hip fractures. The healthcare cost is gonna be over $9 billion. That was from 2016. And it's expected to double by 2015. So um, the cost issue, whether you pay attention to it or not, is actually extremely important because it is gonna come and play a major role um, as, the, as the years go by. So there, there's certain things when we get our patients, there's certain things we can control, there's certain things we, we can't control, right? And so we want to be cognizant of, of both things, right? So the uncontrolled parameters, we can't control how good the bones are in our patients, right? They show up to the ER, they're old, they're young, they're uh, medically unstable, they could be healthy, fracture personality we can't control, but there are things that, that, that we can control. How good of a reduction are we getting? I just mentioned earlier in a in the talk upstairs, you know, intertrochanteric hip fractures are one of the few fractures where if we get a malunion, we're high-fiving everybody in the room, right? It's great. It healed. It may not heal straight, but it healed, so that's great. There's, uh, th th there may be something to that. Implant selection, that's what we're going to talk about uh, and debate a little bit today, and then obviously implant placement, which is, the mo which is one of the more important things as well. It doesn't matter, you know, whether you pick a hip screw or intermedian nail. If you don't put it in the right way and in the right method, um, either one are, can be bound to fail. So it's important, again, just mentioned earlier, you must recognize the fracture pattern, stable versus unstable, and then you have different variants. So what makes one stable versus unstable, again, this is just repeating what um, Dr. Mir just said, that postramedial comminution where the lesser trochanter is off, you have that lateral wall blowout, you have trochanteric comminution, a lot of us have been in those cases where we're starting to get our guide pin at the medial slope of the tip of the trochanter, and you can't even put the pin in there because the whole thing is just comminuted, you sometimes just go straight to the, uh, the ball tip. And of course, you know, the reverse oblique and the subtroke variants. Again, this is just a schematic that was put up a little bit earlier. The only reason I put this in there, the top line, the, the A1s are the, are the stable ones. The A3s, the ones are, the, are at the bottom, are the, the variants. Those are unstable. And the ones in the middle, the A2s, are also, uh, I would argue, unstable. So what are the advantages of, of intermedian nails? There's a decreased moment bending arm compared with hip screws, right? That's just basic science, um, basic uh, physics analysis. There are lower rates of collapse. I think that's something we can agree about. There's going to be a lot of debate on which has more blood loss, which has lead blood, less blood loss in the OR over the course of, you know, a week. There's all studies showing, you know, uh, there's different parameters for each one. But lower rates of varus collapse have been shown with intermedian nails. The nails are obviously load-sharing, right? They're not load-bearing. The example that uh, Hassan just gave, again, percutaneous technique. I mean, we do a ton of nails at Cooper. And our residents have become pretty facile in doing them. They can do them in small incisions. They put them down, and it's, it's usually a very, very quick procedure. And the other thing is these patients who, that we're talking about, these geriatric hip fractures, it's pathologic bone, right? Why would you not want to prophylax the whole femur, right? We already know that they broke because of osteoporotic reasons for the most part, but why not protect the whole bone? Right? Because I can guarantee you sometime in your career, or if you're taking care of any of these patients, you will have a fracture below your hip screw. 
So just going through a couple of papers, and I'm not going to go through each one. Um, again, just trying to go quickly. Unstable uh, fracture patterns are becoming more common in geriatric population. This uh, international study, they showed that intermedian nails compared to hip screws had less, less intraoperative blood loss, less OR time, and early rates of ambulation. We also just showed you a slide of the cost. Cost is a very dubious um, parameter, right? Are you just looking at the cost of the implant? Then sure, the cost, hip, hip, uh, hip screws are cheaper. But if you look at the course of the treatment of, of these fractures, if a hip screw fails, the cost is um, exponential. So hip screw and side plate is not always cheaper. If you have a stable fracture pattern, use a hip screw and they heal, yes, it's cheaper. But if they fail or if they have a complication or you need to revise it, there's a cost in failure as well. And that's something that has to be considered. Again, Baumgartner study uh, in core, this is a little bit of an older study, surgical time 23% less, blood loss is 44% less. And then user, depend, user dependence is really what uh, was a confounding factor in this study for fluoroscopy time. So as you get a little bit more facile, a little bit um, better with these, you know, locking distally with these long nails is actually doesn't take as long as sometimes we think. Um, all functional outcomes. Does using one implant versus the other make patients feel better? Do they get up quicker? Do they functionally do better, and there's no causal relationship. It's, it, there's no study that says that if you use a nail, you're 100% functionally gonna be better versus a hip screw. There are correlations to earlier weight bearing that shows that nails can have uh, patients who uh, weight bear earlier compared with the hip screw, but I think the, the, the jury is still out. And if you just look at the third column in that table that I put up there, you can see that a lot of it says no difference but there's two or three in there that says there's a correlation towards nails having earlier, um, earlier, earlier return to weight bearing. Again, these are other parameters. And it's a very busy slide, but again, these just go through uh, you know, intraoperative blood loss, which nails are less, time to mobilization, which nails are also less. But again, these are all confounding factors. If you look at overall blood loss for you know, day, hospital day three, four, five, they sometimes become equivocal. The other uh, concept in terms of uh, functional outcome for these uh, patients is this concept of femoral medial, uh, medialization, excuse me, and less shortening. There's studies that have been shown, and I'll show you the, one of the last studies, that shows femoral medialization in nails are significantly less, and then they correlate it to functional outcome. So there's higher rates of femoral medialization in sliding hip screws, and there's um, that medialization they've sometimes correlated to poor functional outcomes. So in conclusion, I would say all three unstable fracture patterns should be treated with an intermediate nail. Those stable, the ones that are non-displaced, don't, don't have those characteristics of what makes them unstable. A sliding hip screw is absolutely appropriate. I don't think the sliding hip screw is a dead implant. I think it's something we still need to teach in our training programs. But also just realize, I think as we progress, um, you know, surgeon and experience level also is, is, play, plays a role. A lot of times, you know, our, our, our younger residents haven't even put in hip screws yet. So, you know, we, we, we're definitely looking, uh, you know, for cases that we still need to teach them this technique. That's it. Thank you. Okay. We need to vote again. Sliding hip screw gained some, gained some fans, but still the IM nail takes it. <laughs>